Welcome back to another episode of the Huxley Morton podcast, the show where each week we speak to pharma company owners and industry leaders sharing their stories of personal and professional growth. We're now on series four of the show, and as you may already be aware, we're on a mission to help clinical researchers from around the world with tips, tricks, and inspiration. So if you could do me a quick favor and please hit that follow or subscribe button, it really does help more than you'll ever know. For now though, sit back, relax, and let's take things from here. This week, I am joined by Robert Goldman. Robert is one of the directors at Techfields Pharma, uh, which I believe are a small-ish biotech, Robert, if I'm correct. That's right. Perfect. Well, I've given you a bit of an introduction there, but look, I guess in your own words, you know, give us a quick intro as to, yeah, who you are, the the company, and an overview of, of, of what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, James. Uh, first of all, for having me. Um, it's certainly an honor to be here with you on the on the podcast with your audience. And again, my name is Robert Goldman. Um, I'm an associate director here at Tech Fields Pharma. Um, been here about a year and a month so far. Um, I spent nearly a decade on the CRO side um, of clinical research. I, I started, you know, James, way at the bottom, um, entry level project specialist, actually. Right. Um, you know, coming out of uh, graduate school. So, you know, um, there, there's been a lot of chatter lately about, you know, advanced degrees and how to enter the industry. And, you know, you just people kind of have sometimes a little bit sense of an entitlement. You know, I have this advanced degree. I deserve to be at a high level position right away. But, um, you know, that wasn't my case. I understood the trajectory, the career path, the p- possibilities, the light at the end of the tunnel, if you will. So I um, started as a project specialist, um, 2011-ish. What is a project specialist? I mean, it's quite a broad title, isn't it? It, it, it really is. I mean, it, it's really just an admin role. You know, you're, right. you're providing support to the clinical team in, you know, meeting minutes and sending out agendas and facilitating um, filings in the TMF. It's really an admin based role, kind of just getting your feet wet, understanding the intertwinings of a of a clinical team on the CRO side Mm. and you support wherever you can. You really work under a project manager. So it's more project management than clinical operations. Right. But it's a foot in the door, Mm -hmm. you know, and and I had to you know, I had to I had to kind of bite on my ego and say, you know what, There, there shouldn't be an ego here. And um, I was super grateful to INC Research for giving me at the time, which is now Cineos, for those of you that are watching, um, you know, I was super grateful for the opportunity. And, and James, you know, I knew personally what type of work ethic I have, what knowledge I was bringing to the table. And I said to myself, you know what, let me get in the door. I actually had to relocate. I moved from Michigan to Austin, Texas. Wow. You know, had to get had to get an apartment and didn't really know many people. I had a couple colleagues that I, that I knew that were in the industry, but, you know, it was a completely new environment. Mm. So I took a huge, you know, I just I knew what I had to do to get in the industry. So I moved down to Austin. I worked at INC and, and literally within three months, I was able to demonstrate. I started doing listing reviews and triangulating data checks. I was working in an analgesic portfolio at the time for a controlled substance for, for pain studies. That's really mm. where I, 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 that's why I shine where I shine now. But long story short is I started doing all this work that wasn't asked of me, you know, just based on my medical background, my, yeah. my training and work and all that. And very quickly within three months, um, you know, they, they presented me with a CRA role. Wow. And I was, you that, know, literally that, quick, that coming. Cause that, that, is, that is quick, right? that quick James. And so I remained office based and I went through the CRA training Academy over there, Mm. you know, started doing shadowing visits. I started going on different co-monitoring visits and literally with, by the sixth month of my employment, I was signed off to, to independently monitor, you know, I was doing mostly, I was doing mostly, you know, PSSVs, pre-site selection visits. These days they call them SQVs, site qualification visits. Hmm. So it, it got me, you know, I, I was able to learn to start, you know, you know, being a being what they call the road warrior. You know, I was out hmm. there and doing qualification feasibility visits. That's typically where entry level series, you know, start getting experience interacting and you know assessing sites for for clinical trial conduct. What, what so, I like about that, Robert, is I guess yeah. the beginning of the story before you go on too much is just that whole checking your ego thing. Because right. I have, I mean, it was from one of the, the founders of quite a 
like well-known research organization on LinkedIn. Now I won't bad mouth them because I know that they, they do a lot of good work, but there was almost a bit of a complaint recently saying, look, some of our members have got PhDs. They've got this, they've got this. Why are they not getting CRA roles? Now you've jumped on here and almost said almost the opposite. And I'm kind of, as a recruiter, I would have to say I sit in your camp where I don't really care about qualifications for me it's communication and what the person is going to bring to the table. So what, I mean, what was going through your mind there? I mean, how did you manage to check the ego? Cause let, let's face it. Sometimes it's hard, right? James, it was tough. I mean, I can't, <laughs> I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I did. I mean, I literally was, I'd go, I'd go into the office. I'm in this cubicle. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I, I literally just talked to myself. I put my head in my hands and I say, my God, how did I, how did I end up like in this cubicle? I feel like I'm in the movie office space, yeah. you know, like, but well, have you seen my stapler? Right. And I'm just <laughs> like, I, I just, I, it was, it was a challenge. I mean, I'm not gonna, gonna lie to you. It was, it was a tough challenge, but I knew that I was grateful for the opportunity. Once your foot is in the door, Right. Mm -hmm. And if you have a high level advanced degree, you, you kind of have to put that on, on the door. So, you know, our good friend, Dan Spera, he just did a podcast the other day mm -hmm. about advanced degrees and, and people who have PhDs and return on investment. You know, people spend hundreds of thousands of dollars, years of their lives getting these degrees and they expect an instant ROI on this degree. Unfortunately, yeah. it's just not the case. These organizations want experience and and on it, there's from my perspective i'm not disparaging anybody you know in their career goals and ambitions but there is no degree and you know if you have a master's in clinical research and you know health administration public health nothing prepares you for clinical trial operations or being sponsor side zero side mm. over experience end of yeah. story it's that simple i mean there's this is not a complicated formula you can go to this academy you can go to this course you can go to that school you can have this degree and that degree but if you don't have real world experience real world evidence of of living the day-to-day -day life mm. it, it, it's tough it's a tough yeah. sell because education is one thing you could be great scholastically but if you don't have the people skills the soft skills the inter skills the leadership skills the go-getter skills that you need mm. that's why all these you know these candidates are constantly getting you know looked over i i mentor um you know some some junior colleagues you know i have a couple mentors who are master degree holders i have a mentor who a mentee who's a phd holder I'm actually meeting with him tomorrow morning, you know, out of the gratis of my heart, because I feel like it's my obligation to the community to help those who, who need a little bit of direction and kind of to help them check that ego, James, you know, because mm -hmm. it's not always easy. And when they hear my story, it's like, you know, you just kind of have to bite your tongue, keep your head low, go in and prove yourself. You're a PhD student, you're a PhD holder, you know your capability, right? Yeah. You know, you can be successful in a rigorous environment. So translate those skills from a rigorous academic environment into a rigorous work environment, because clinical trials is not a nine to five job. It's just mm. not. It, it's now I'm not saying it's eight hours straight, right? You might have two, three hour gaps in your day. But then there's days where you're, you're, you're constantly running. Like I'll tell you, when I was a CRA, I was a CRA for a long time, over eight years. Wow. And, well, and, and no, no gray hairs yet either. So you, oh, you I, I, I got gray hairs. Trust me. I'm staying must, a little bit. Must, far, have been, I'm, must have been all right <laughs> to manage that stress. You know, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm very great, James. I keep the sideburns cut now. So uh, there you go. get rid of the gray. But, um, you know, and, and what I'm trying to say is, you know, jump at getting up in the morning, you know, 4 a.m., getting to the airport by six, you know, whether I was monitoring in California, Washington State, Colorado, Texas, wow. you know, two, three hour flight, get in a rental car, be on site by 10 a.m. local time or 9 a.m. local time, staying there all day long, getting on a plane, flying to the next state, doing it again. And, you know, I was home maybe two, three days a month. So, you know, yeah, it, it was it was a, I mean, I, I, you know, and I put that upon myself a little bit because I just, you know, but on the other hand, when you're doing feasibility and you have to run in the early days of your career and 
you know, knock out the expectation in the industry typically pre COVID was, you know, eight to 10 days on site. Mm. But when you add in remote days on site, now the expectations 12 to 15, even 20 days on site, right. And those come with trip reports and they come with documentation and TMF submissions and the whole rigmarole that you go through. So, you know, I, what I'm saying is I, I, I knew my work ethic. I knew yeah. what I was able to prove. Where, where did it come? Where did it come from? Because I, I guess look, there's two things here. I'm thinking. You know, you're talking about the PhD guys. You know, and even yourself. You kind of you did more what was than what was expected of you, and then you ended up getting that promotion and probably getting paid more than what <laughs> was expected of you. And that's kind of sometimes how it goes. But where did this? It sounds like pretty insane work ethic come from. Was that, I mean, I've had other people on, on the show and it's been, you know, it's been parents. It's been sometimes, you know, not the nicest situations with, you know, family members suffering with various diseases and things. What what was it for you that gave you that drive? That's sometimes what I'm interested in. Yeah. So for me personally, it was just, I don't, I don't know if I can pinpoint it to a specific thing, you know, but I knew that I wanted to make a global impact and really affect patients' lives. I really, my, my goal was to always say, you know, I wanted to see a commercial on TV here in the States. You, you know, they advertise drug commercials all the time. Right. And I just wanted, I wanted to see myself saying, wow, I worked on that compound, you know, and yeah. that was my biggest driver, I think. And you know, I just, I wanted, I didn't, I wanted to be successful in this industry. And it, it was just an internal fire that I really lit under my own, my own volition. I mean, there was yeah. nothing, nothing, nobody was pushing for me because honestly, there's, you know, plenty of people who are in this industry, they come in, they do their work, they go home and it's, it's, you know, it's nothing more, it's nothing less. And, and that's, mm. there's nothing wrong with that. You know, I'm not saying you should go out and kill yourself for your employer. Cause you know, you'd be replaced by time you're, you know, they're lowering your casket in the ground. Okay. I'm being honest yeah. with you. Um, but for me, it was just, I knew what I could bring to the table and I wanted to demonstrate my medical background. I wanted to demonstrate my value. And so you know, it was just, it was my, I did it for myself. Doing it, doing, Not, doing it for you. Yeah. I, I, it for me. You know, it, I completely it, get that. You know, it and, wasn't my parents, you know, I was honestly one of the first college graduates in my family. You know, my, my parents didn't go to, I mean, my dad was uber successful in retail, um, you know, had a large European clothing corporation. My mom was a, was a teacher. I shouldn't say I was the only, you know, I, I was the first college graduate with my dad's last name, I should say, you know, um, <laughs> And, um, you know, so I had both ends of the spectrum, you know, my mom was a master's degree in special education. Um, and, you know, my dad was a high school graduate yeah. and, you know, uber, uber successful. And I just, you know, my, my brother went into that retail aspect and I kind of went in my own direction, you know, and a lot of things people don't know about me, James, I'm also a pilot. Um, I'm an FAA certified private pilot with a commercial rating. So, really? you know, I, I, I play the drums. What, what, so, what the, sort of, what sort of, um, <laughs> Jets and things, does that enable you to fly? I mean, I don't so want to go too off pace, but I'm just- Yeah, sure, that, sure. Right? <laughs> no, but I, yeah, no, I, I've been flying since I was 16. Um, and, you know, when you're when you're getting into commercial ratings, I, I'm, I'm type rated. So it's called type rating. So I can fly a Citation 5. I can mm. fly a Citation 10, um, you know, things like that. But for me, my most favorite things to do are flying, you know, the Cessna 172, 182s, 210s. Pipers and diamond stars, like, you know, that's really flying where you're not putting everything into the autopilot and computers. But my point is, in saying that, is I kind of went in my own direction. You know, I, I, I went, my parents honestly wanted me to go get therapy when I started flying because they were like, do you have some kind of a death wish? You know, and I'm like, absolutely not. I just find it insanely fascinating, you know, the physics behind it and everything. Mm. And um, so, you know, um, I, I just, my point in saying that is not to, toot my horn, but it's, I just went in my own direction, James, and I wanted to be multifaceted. I mean, I was an M. Coles, Michigan Commission on Law Enforcement Standards, reserve police officer also for two years. Mm. You know, I went and got that certification. So I kind of wanted to just do all these like different things, you know, yeah. play music and go. So, you know, I just, that's who I am. And it has to be part of your, your genetic makeup and your DNA. You have to want it. If, mm. if you're just gonna get in the sense that whatever it is you're doing, you just want to excel. You like, I, I, I can understand it. You just like, you like winning. <laughs> is that a fair, James, fair yeah, assessment? I, I guess, I guess that's a fair assessment. I like to win, but you know, don't, don't get me wrong. I've had a lot of losses, you know, mm. and just like Rocky said in the movie, you know, it's not about how hard you get hit. 
you know, it's about getting back up and doing it all mm. over again. Right. Mm -hmm. So everyone falls down. I have fallen down. I've been rejected, you know, but you just have to, you have to dig deep and you have to keep going. So a lot of the people I, you know, a lot of the folks that I mentor, you know, it, it's Robert, I'm always getting looked over. I, you know, I don't understand it. I've sent out hundreds of applications, James, I, I, I take a, a play right out of your playbook. I, I have really relayed some of the information you and I have talked about privately, right? Mm. Um, in terms of using those rejections as your advantage, how can you grow your network? I always say my network is my net worth, you mm -hmm. know, um, having people like you in my network, you know, that you, you know, you're very successful in your agency, you have a great reputation. I like the way you think, I like the way you move and that to me is invaluable. Even if it's not a business transaction now, you never know what the future may hold. Mm. You know, um, I somebody reached out to me yesterday from a startup lab in Austin. It happened to be actually in Austin. And, you know, we, we just had an introductory conversation, which turned into, you know, him asking if I can be a consultant on his advisory board, you know, for wow. his vision. And I, I mean, I'm, that, that's my point and what I'm trying to say. So networking, you know, and just checking things and, and, and moving through the pro career progression is critical because nobody in this industry is going to do it for you. And I'm going to tell you some sad truths. Okay. Mm. And you, you can take it or leave it and let's hear it in the comment section below, but CROs will work you for every dollar you're worth. They will over allocate you. You're going to be working at over a 1.0 FTE almost all the time especially in a senior role, as you gain experience, you now you're marketable and they're not going to tell you to slow down. So, so it, it really kind of bit me a little bit because, Oh, Robert will do it. Ask Robert to do it. Oh, Robert, will go clean. you're a Fiona. Yeah, exactly. And Robert will go clean this up. Robert will accompany him. And I found myself, you know, jet setting across, you know, way outside of my region. I live on the West coast of the United States. I was going mm. to, to New Jersey. I was going to Florida. I was going to, I mean, I even went to Halifax, Nova Scotia. I was going, I mean, I was going all over the country to, to just, you know, to help, Yeah. to help, you know, Let me and interject there a little bit, because I guess I'm, 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 I'm on the same page here with the, the CROs and, and how much they will work people. Now I often get applicants come to me from either the sponsor side or the academic research side and they say i work with cro's i know how it's going to be and i'm like i can't speak out of you know personal experience because i've not worked for a cro right but every client i speak to wants that cro experience and some of the more transparent and honest people that i've, I've spoke to have said held, held their hands up and said james before i went to a cro i just didn't know what i didn't know so as part of what you're giving to us here, could you maybe tell us <laughs> some of those things that people may not know? And I, I get yeah. a sense that that's what you're touching on here, but yeah, perhaps if you can just expand on that, I mean, cause that is one of the biggest things I come across all the time. Literally, yeah, absolutely. The time. And you know, James, there's a lot that I don't know still, right? I always say that I don't know what I don't know. I love that saying, you know, mm. people don't know what they don't know, but yeah. you know, in terms of the CRO workforce, you know, they are a lot of, people will, will boast culture and work-life balance. The truth of the matter is it's grass. It, it's the same grass. Mm -hmm. I, I don't care. I, I've been in enough CROs. And again, you know, you can go to my LinkedIn profile and take a look at what CROs I've been at. Large ones, you know, the, the most well-known ones. Mm -hmm. And I've worked at some of them for as long as six years. You know, so I, I had a good tenure. I, I, you know, I did have to hop after two, two and a half years, you know, because in this industry, in order to get compensated fairly, unfortunately, here's a thing you may or may not know. You know, I, I've been in a situation where I asked for a salary adjustment. You know, I'm like, mm -hmm. here are my achievements. I've been here for five plus years, you know, and I, I know you just hired in John Jones over there and, and he's making 30,000 more than I am. He's it, yeah. And, and, and it's like that level and know the I've systems. Got, yeah. Know the systems. I'm a value. I'm an ad, you know, I, I know like you guys know my work ethic. I need minimal oversight rejected. Sorry, Robert, we've reviewed your salary and you're kind of, you know, you're, you're, you're where you need to be. 
That is just so, such BS, isn't it? Like, because I I would always encourage people do what you did, right? You know, if you're unhappy, or actually, if you're happy where you are, but the financial side of things starts to play a part, just go and speak to your boss. They can say yes or they can say no, and then immediately you know what your next move is. <laughs> I mean, James, I told my, my, my manager, I go, look, you know, I, I need this to happen. I'm, you know, and I, I sent a long email with all my achievements, you know, and at the time the sponsor was sidestepping the project manager coming directly to me as a clinical trial manager. And, you know, it was, it was just, you know, I, I really deserved it. I mean, I was loyal to it, to a fall. I was, mm-hmm. I, I, I never had a late report, never had late, uh, never had a late, you know, expense sheet, never had a late timesheet. I, I was always updating my internal trackers. My systems were good. My clinical team was always above board, like just everything you could imagine, right? Mm. And, and they said, no, thank you. Sorry, we can't adjust your salary. However, we can give you a promotion to a project manager. We'll give you a salary bump. But James, I didn't want that. I don't mm. want more responsibility for a salary that I deserve in my current role. Because as a PM, you know, you're responsible for every functional team lead. and Quite frankly, I'll tell you another thing how CROs operate. You know, you're as a project manager, you're responsible for everybody and what they do. And I'm tired. I, I grew really tired of chasing people down because mm-hmm. my attention to detail happens to be, you know, a little bit maybe borderline OCD, right? And so the fact that somebody else isn't doing what they need to do or or pull their own weight, you know, it's now my problem, I have to answer to that. And, you know, there's only so many conversations and I don't want to be a tattletale and go to their line manager. And then we start Mm. having these performance discussions. That's just not what I enjoy doing. It's almost a frustration, is it? It's one of those things where you're like, why am I always right? (laughs) Yeah. Why am I all like, why? Exactly. Exactly. I mean, it's a blessing and a curse, right? It can be a blessing and a curse. It is. It is. It is. But then you get on a team and you're, you know, you're running. And so, a real life example is so this company offered me, you know, a role and with a salary bump, but they rejected my, my request and rationale. They said, mm. you know, sorry, we can't. And I'm like, my gosh, I go, my colleague, a very good friend of mine, I wish I could say his name. Not only not three weeks ago, did he get a $20,000 salary bump, Wow, you know, and he was asked to keep it quiet, but James, people talk. I mean, come on, everybody, yeah. everybody talks. Let's, let's not I, act like, oh, please. I'm, keep I'm in recruitment. I know, I know all too well that people talk. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, I knew it could be done. So I went back to my line manager. I said, you know what? I think the writing's on the wall, mm. you know, and, uh, you know, within two weeks, I happened to resign that, 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 that um, position and, you know, moved on to bigger and brighter pastures. But my point is, what I was trying to say is around to come back to the whole point of this conversation is in the CRO industry, in clinical research itself, you have to own your career. It's that simple. If you don't own your career, nobody's going to do it for you. Mm-hmm. You can sit in a CRA role for, for 15 years. And if you're not ambitious to go move into management or maybe listen, there's nothing wrong with being a CRA. I have friends that are are like, Robert, I would never be a CTM. I would never be a PM. I'd never be a director. You got to have your head examined. Mm. I like being, I like traveling. I like the the content guys are killing it. Killing it. Honestly. And the lifestyle is honestly like, you know, it's fun. You know, you're in a different state. you get to see a whole bunch of places you would never see in your entire life. Mm. You know, you're eating, you're eating good. You're staying at great rest, you know, hotels, you're driving cars, you got status, you you know, you're a platinum member here. You're an executive elite here. You get first class upgrades. You know, people love that lifestyle. And you know what? Honestly, as a CRA, you go in, you manage your site, you make sure things are good, button it up, write your report, and you're on to the next one. All this political stuff that we deal with in the background from management and contract negotiation and budgets and proposals and, and vendor management and making decisions, you know, it, it's it's tiresome. I mean, I have to be honest with you. It, it, it can, you know, everybody talks about burnout, burnout, mm. burnout. You know, it's, I can see it. I can mm. really see it. And that's why I have a ton of colleagues. I mean, you know, some of the quintessential CRAs that you could ever imagine, you know, they're like, I wouldn't consider management for, for anything. And I can tell you, these people have 15, 20 plus years of experience. They're making just as much as I'm making in an associate director role. Mm. 
mm. or even a yeah. director role would be making. So it's all about what you want. But at the end of the day, I think the take home message of what I'm trying to convey to everybody that might be watching this video is you have to own your career. Nobody's going to open the door for you and say, hey, James, you know what? You're so you're so great. Uh, you know, here's a 20% raise. Um, here's a promotion. And, you know, here's a team for you to lead of 50 people. Nobody's ever going to do that. If you're not vocal and you don't take control of your own career, you're, you could be very stagnant in a, in an organization that's 20, 30,000 headcount. Right. So for me, I had a colleague that I worked with you know, a decade ago um, when I was in the entry level positions where I quickly was moving up at INC mm. and, and I, hadn't, I hadn't talked to her for over 10 years and she reached out to me out of, out of the blue, just, Hey, you know, how are you? Can you call me? You know, want to catch up. And I was like really excited to hear from her because she took a really good, like, she, she kind of took me under her wing. You know, she mm. knew my passion, she knew my drive and she brought me over to where I'm currently at here at tech fields. Uh, you, really, know? I was, you know what you beat me to my next question i was yeah gonna, i was gonna say so how did you go because there's a lot of people that are looking to go from cro world sponsor side yeah can't it normally was. make the jump but i guess probably again you put in the work of networking 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 keeping in touch doing the right thing and all of a sudden shock an opportunity presents itself right that's exactly right and you know believe me I, it was a tough sell because you know, my, my current company, we're a small, flat organization, you know, um, we, we are, we're, we're late into phase three clinical development with our lead asset. And, you know, coming to us, it, it's essentially a startup biotech, you know, mm. and the high risk, high reward, you know, being a pilot, James, I love making decisions, you know, you have to, yeah. you have to be a quick thinker, you know, you, you, you know, if something, you have an emergency, you got to you got to think quickly. What do I do to, to save your your life? Right. Mm. So, you know, I like that high risk, high reward thing for me. It's not for everybody. Some people need SOPs. Some people need work instructions. Some people need that direction. You know, for me, I wasn't afraid to go into the land of unknown. Right. Mm. I knew I could quickly transition to the sponsor side just because of my tenure at the CRO side. I've, I've spent so long let's call it eating shit. I'm just going to say it like that. Mm-hmm. Okay. From, from the CROs and, and the sponsors alike, where I knew that number one, I knew what not to be like yeah. on the sponsor side. Uh-huh. It, it allowed, you, you, you dealt with that person, right? <laughs> exactly. I'm like, I'll never be that guy. Mm-hmm. Um, and also I knew, you know, what the sponsors are looking for, right? Just over the tenure of being at large CROs working on a vast, you know, therapeutic area uh, array. And I just knew how to cater to the, to the, to the sponsors. They were our clients, right? We, you know, my biggest achievement, it wasn't getting internally recognized. It wasn't winning CTM of the, of the quarter. It wasn't getting an award. I got, you know, all these silver recipient awards, gold recipient awards. Do they do award. that, do they? I, I didn't it, know they, that. They do it. Oh, do they? And, and they I get, wasn't aware of that. And they give you a small like thousand dollar monetary bonus and, you know, like, but, but the point is none of that did anything for me, James, none of that, even the pat on the backs never did anything for me, mm-hmm. but I'm going to give you one, I'm going to give you one example. And it, it always sticks with me till this day. This actually happened about three and a half, four years ago. I transitioned onto a study that was in a complete disarray behind the line timeline in enrollment. I was a clinical tr- team manager at that time. Mm-hmm. And I, I transitioned on, it was a phase two endometriosis pain study. And, you know, the sponsor was just very upset. CRO was, you know, on the hook financially at this time, paying them because of penalty clauses in the work order um, and the contract and, and things like that. And so I took the whole study, eliminated certain roles, just kind of revamped the whole process and, you know, working with the director of project delivery and saying, here's why we don't need this person. Here's why we don't need this person. We need this person. I'm going to take enrollment under my wings. We're going to do it this way. And James, I closed enrollment within four and a half months, wow. January of that year. And the DPD came back to me. She's like, I should have brought you on way sooner, but the best compliment, it wasn't that, that what that didn't do anything for me. The best compliment was, I was told from day one, when I transitioned on the study, they were like, Robert, this medical monitor is just a pain in our ass. Like he Mm -hmm. is just a grumpy old man who just, he's just mean, he's curt, 
He's mm. just, you know, just, just nothing nice to say about the guy. Yeah. Okay. And I said, okay, thank you for letting me know. Long story short, not two and a half, three months later, he saw the progression in which I was taking the program mm. and he called me up, which was very unusual. And I wish I could say his name, but I'm not going to. Um, and, you know, he's like, he's like, Robert, I just want to tell you something. I don't give compliments very often. Mm. He's like, but you're, you're something special. He's like, try. And he literally, I, I have this in writing, James, I'll share this with you. Maybe we could put a redacted version of this. I still have it um, uh -huh. on, on, you know, as a screenshot or something with this attached to this video, he, he sent of this large email to the, you know, VP of, you know, operations. And he sent it of course, to the whole project team, all the, all the managerial functional team lead stakeholders. And he's like, mm -hmm. He's like, Robert is something special. Trust me. I know what I'm talking about. He said, wow. So he goes, I, a personal recommendation from basically a, this a-hole that everyone was moaning about. You got it. And it, you've completely flipped it on him and completely whatever. flipped it. That to me is the ROI. That's what was gratifying. James. How, I mean, the, how did you feel at that point then? Because look, I, again, unbelievable. I've been there, won awards, got big commission checks, but some, it's those little things that sometimes. James that to me i was i was on cloud nine i was mm -hmm. like i i called them up and i said i'm so appreciative i can't thank you enough and you know i said you know i'll never be you know i, I go I, i'll never know how to repay you for this for this accolade that you gave me and he literally sent me back how about a million dollars <laughs> and and i and i re and i replied back to him i go if i had it i'd share it with you he goes well played best of luck to you. And he, you know, he moved on from the company, mm. but the point is, here's a guy who took time out of his day yeah. to do something that's just, that's totally against his grain. He just mm. didn't do it. And to me, that was the most gratifying aspect of, that's, of he everything. He did do it. It just took that right switch to be flicked. That's the thing. It's like, sometimes people paint a picture of people and you just like, no, 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 no. that's, that's how it is for you. That's your, your mindset on it. That's your results exactly. on it. It could be different. You know, you, you prove that right there. Um, exactly. So, yeah, I mean, what an asset to have on that project. I mean, it, I, I, if I was your manager at that time, I'd have been rubbing my hands together and just thinking we, we need to keep this guy. Yeah. I mean, and, and James, we all, we all jumped on a virtual zoom like this and we were mm. doing tequila shots literally at like <laughs> at 1230 in the afternoon. I'm like, I'm literally sitting here with the VP, the executive directors, like, you know, awesome. at, a, at, a, at a large CRO with, you know, 30,000 headcount. And mm. I literally, you know, the project manager, the director, the VP, he went up to, he had a kegerator in his bedroom upstairs. He had one downstairs, you know, we're all, you know, just, just drinking at 1230 in the afternoon. Cause we closed enrollment on a study that we never thought was going to end, you know? Um, so there are really cool experiences and, you know, just because it's a large organization, you know, yes, they do try to make it, you know, I don't want to call it siloed, but they try and make it like, you know, here's your team. Mm. The problem is, you know, you never know it's a gamble on the team you're going to get. Right. So uh -huh. jumping from CRO to CRO to CRO and expecting a different culture, a different, this, a different, yeah, maybe a little bit, but like I said, at the top of the show, it's, it's grass just in a different area, but it's at the end of the day, it's grass. Mm. And so I have a lot of friends, you know, who I, I keep in touch with and, you know, they've gone to small size CROs, mid size CROs. And, you know, I just heard from one, two days ago, you know, Kyle, if you're watching, shout out to you, you know who you are. Um, he's like, Robert, it's, it's the same crap, man. You know, it started off great, you know, onboarded, everything was hunky dory, but man, just, you know, everybody's in Sierra land. They're struggling with resources mm. and you can't always be transparent with the client. That was one of my biggest struggles. I, I kind of got, to, I'm like, I can't sit here and continue to, to fib to these, to our clients. Like they're asking, where is this person? Where's this person? Why is not this visit happened? When are you going to do this? You promised yeah. us this on this day. And, you know, everybody gets to a point where it's like, you know, what do you say? So when I got the opportunity to come 360 and come on the sponsor side, um, you know, I was grateful for the opportunity. And I knew that I was going to be set up for success because I honestly don't know how you can lead and manage oversee a CRO if you don't have that prerequisite experience of 
at least some time managing a team or being an integral part of operations on the CRO side. Uh-huh. You know, it's it, it so just because would you say that's almost essential? Then, because again, like, sometimes I, I speak to folks and they're, you know, they they're very green, right? And they're like, James, I want to go sponsor side. I'm and I'm just like, you kind of need to take, you know, your, James, your advice from right at the top of the show, which was, you know, check your ego. Let's let's go for the process here. Get listen, some CRO side, make the move. I'd like to be a CEO, you know, I mean, it, it like, you know, everybody, I'd like to win the lottery. I mean, you know, I get it. People want instant gratification, mm. but unfortunately, you know, you, you've got to do exactly like you just said, what we talked about, you've got to just crawl before you walk and you've got to earn your stripes. It's, mm. it's just that simple. And, and there aren't really any, you know, things that are going to allow you to, to make that shortcut. And again, I, you know, we're interviewing right now at tech fields um, mm-hmm. to bring on, you know, additional clinical trial managers. And we've, we've held, you know, a handful of interviews. We have a couple more this afternoon. And it's amazing because a lot of the candidates have only sponsor side experience as a consultant. And, you know, for me, it's like, well, if you're a consultant, there's two outcomes. Number one, they're going to extend your contract if you're great. Mm-hmm. And number two, if you're great, they're going to make you a full-time employee. So if the reason for leaving is your contract's coming to an end, it kind of doesn't rub me the right way personally. Cause it's like, I want to understand, well, why aren't they renewing your contract when this particular company has 185 job listings on LinkedIn right now? Okay. Mm. So what I'm trying to say is they don't have any CRO side experience. And so I say to myself, well, how can you manage and oversee and know the dynamic and the struggles that CROs experience daily yeah. If you've never been in those shoes before. Right. So I think that's why my trajectory and I can tell you in full confidence now being on the sponsor side, would I ever go back to the CRO side? You know, the answer, James, the answer is a resoundingly hell no. Mm. Right. Unless it was a super incredible opportunity where I, you know, was able to really, you know, impact the organization from a development perspective, not, Working where you're a, where you're kind of calling the shots rather than exactly you know listening to the shots and, and trying to you know execute them yeah I, exactly I, I so yeah. yeah so I mean I would never I mean I would literally probably think about changing careers before going back to the to that former life right mm. so but but again I'm I'm grateful for that opportunity because without it I wouldn't be in a successful position to where I can make a difference. You know, yeah. when I talk, like when I talk to the CRO, you know, I, my clinical lead yesterday, he's like, Robert, I, I, I humbly disagree with you. And the medical monitor says, well, you know, I, I agree with what Robert is saying. Yeah. And, and I, and what I did was at the end of the call, it was a large team call. I, I sent him a text message and I go, Hey, I didn't mean to, you know, put down a gavel and, and make a decision because I want to be collaborative because again, empathy, like I know how he felt, mm. right? And I texted him and we ended up, you know, I, I go, I want to hear you out. I want to hear you out and let's let's talk it through, okay? And it was about a patient meeting eligibility, yeah. right? And we had an amendment on the tails and the patient currently as it stands did not meet eligibility criteria. And he wanted to keep the patient in the study until the patient had the opportunity to rescreen under right. the new amendment, which would now make the patient eligible. But I'm like, why would you want to do that? That's not clean. Screen fail the patient, get medical monitor approval to rescreen the patient under the new amendment in which they're now qualifying. Mm. But the moment a patient is no longer eligible, they can't stay in the study. It doesn't matter if it's at screening baseline or week 22. Yeah. It doesn't matter if it's at week 48 and it's a year long study. If Frustrating it, you know, patient, as it might be, it's like, you've just got to deal with what you can deal with, like control the control. Got to deal with it. But, but I say this example because I put myself in his shoes, mm. you know, and, and, and I wanted him to feel heard. Right. So that just built the relationship even more, you know, and now, you know, he, he's working his tail off because, You know, he understands what, you know, that I know what he's going through. So imagine the opposite scenario, a person like myself, who's overseeing multiple CROs on multiple, you know, programs, Mm. who's never had that empathy or, or position to realize, man, 
you know, this is, I, I like, I want to be heard, you know, I don't want to just be shot down. Yeah. You know, and, and, it, and it just, just going, you just go tete to tete and it just, it helps nobody. Cause it helps let's nobody. Face it, we're, we're all the center of our own universes, right? What like to us, we matter. Our thoughts matter. And I get like, just hearing someone out, whether you decide to act on their things or not is, is the key, isn't it? It's like, exactly, that's, that's James. the big thing all day long. And, and, you know, he really appreciated taking the time and we chatted for 30 minutes, but at the end of the conversation, he's like, you know what, Robert, you're right. And it wasn't about, I wasn't looking for that. It's not about you're right. I'm right. He's right. I'm wrong. That's not what it was about. Mm. I just said from an audit perspective, there's, there's be above reproach, yeah. always go about your daily life and be above reproach. Because if I can ask you a question and I can't put the story together, James, then that leaves areas where an auditor could pick it apart. And just my luck, that'll be the subject that gets reviewed, you know? So to be above reproach and sleep well at night, mm. do things, do things in that manner, you know? But my point is it, that I'm trying to make here, not to get in a specific situation is the empathy that I have, because the first thing we did on the CRO side, after a sponsor was a jerk, mm. we would stop what we're doing after the call we'd all get on another 30, 45 minute call and spend an hour complaining, wow. getting no, no work done. It was a no value ad. It was a venting session. Wow. He's a jerk. This person's a jerk. That one doesn't know what he's doing. This guy's in outer space. I'm so tired of him. He repeats himself. Just, just a round table of bashing. Mm -hmm. And I've literally gone to the CRO and I'm like, I bet you guys are just cursing out, cursing me out. Yeah. I can feel it. My ears are ringing. And you know, understanding that right yep. and understanding the boundaries and how to establish a relationship and make people work for you without them thinking they're working for you i call it the reverse jedi mind trick right mm -hmm. and it's and it's just kind of a tactic that you know you have people working alongside you and they're not they're not providing that friction right mm -hmm. they're just they're just going about their day and they're actually doing above and beyond for you without you having to ask for it. Yeah. So that's what I mean by the reverse, you know, Jedi mind trick in a sense and making sure that they felt heard. I think it's, it's a smart move. And I think ugh, kind of anyone really who kind of just wants to get stuff done. Sometimes it's, you know, I almost class it as an accusation audit. You, you know, you know, full well that recruiters do not often have the best of rep. So when I call people up, I, you know, I sometimes say, look, you know, you've probably come across X, Y, and Z and it frustrates you with recruiters. And they're like, yeah. And it's like, well, let's get it out in the open. Okay. And then I, you know, you solve the problem so that you don't have to. Sometimes for me, it's so that I don't have to listen to 15, 20 minutes hearing about someone's bad experiences with recruiters exactly. that are being in the beginning of call. Cause I'm like, no, look, I'm busy too. I want to help you, but I don't want to hear about all of your past experiences. So it's, it's just, um, yeah, I think it's a smart move that works in your favor and just shows that actually you're hearing someone out, you know, you're showing a bit of empathy and actually it's relatable. That's the main thing, isn't it? I think. Exactly. That's what it's all about, you know, being relatable. And that's why I mentioned earlier, it's critical to have that zero experience. And, and I'll say it again, like I've said already five times, mm. grateful for it. I'm grateful for it, Yeah. but it's positioned me to go on the sponsor side now, but you know, that empathy, that ego check, that collaborative environment. It's just like a one team. I refer to it as one team, you know, environment where they, you know, the, 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 the CRO should be an extension of us mm. in terms of the way we think our operational model, our goals. Nobody wakes up in the morning, James. And they're like, you know what, I'm going to mess this up today. I mean, mm. I, I like to think that they don't wake up with that mentality. Right. Yeah. So people are going to, you know, go about their day. Things are going to happen. Decisions have to be made, but I don't think anybody does it with impunity or on purpose, you know? So it doesn't make any sense to beat people up and run things, you know, where it's just like a gavel. This is the way it's going to be. So I really like to, that's just me, you know, and that's my, the way I like to, to manage things and it's paid out for me. It's, it's really, it's really helped me. And I think those that work alongside with me, would probably share that sentiment, you know, maybe not so much if any colleagues are watching that, Oh, there's Robert. I remember him from the CRO days. I've changed. Yeah. <laughs> I've changed a lot. I was, was going to say, look, you know, in terms of that, you know, clearly sometimes with a bit more experience and things, you know, you learn things about how it works in general, but you also learn a little bit about yourself. And, you know, one of the things that you've highlighted a few times is just being able to check your ego and actually 
do what's right in order to get the result that everyone wants rather than just what you want in that immediate situation you know is there anything else that you you would say that you've learned since starting out really about yourself that you know there is and it's uh you know my chief medical officer he always tells me about the ted lasso rules you know he's like robert what ted lasso rule is that and if you haven't seen the ted lasso check it out i'll send you a meme after this james you'll you'll know what i'm talking about but you can never get in trouble for doing the right thing Mm mm-hmm I, and I think that's a, that's a big motto for me right now. You know, I always try to do the right thing. I try to make decisions in the best interest of everybody involved. And, and that's something that I think I've learned about myself trying very, very hard to keep emotion out of it because, you know, self-control is strength and calmness is mastery. You know, you have to get to a point where your mood doesn't shift based on somebody else's actions, Mm -hmm. right? I can't allow others to control which way I'm going in my life. That's on, that's me. Like I take that accountability. And once you take accountability for those actions, you know, I found that I'm a happier person, right? I can't let my emotions overpower what I know and my intelligence that I, you know, have gathered across, you know, my tenure of being in, in the industry. So that's a, that's an important part of just going about everyday life because, you know, mental health is very important. This industry can beat you up to a pulp very, very quickly. And you've got to create that work-life balance. That's why I have two cell phones, James, you know, (laughs) one for work, one for personal. And people are like, Oh, Robert, why would you want to do that? Well, I've tried it the other way, Mm. you know, and if in, in that work email, whether it's an IRT, IXRS notification, whether it's an IRB notification, whether it's a study communication, whether it's a vendor communication, they're going off 24 seven. There's no shortage of work. Mm. Work will always be there. There's that's, always going to be work. The recruiter calls and the recruiter texts in there, right? That's not, it's not, it's not. <laughs> speaking of, speaking of, just want to give, you know, we, we did a podcast, you were on the, uh, you know, Dan Sparrow's podcast uh-huh. when the three of us were together and we were talking about, you know, you were giving a lot of insights about recruiting and I just have to say one hilarious one. So Dan got, he messaged me yesterday, uh, yesterday and he was like, Robert, look at this one. And the title in the recruitment message was hot CRA role, hot in, uh-huh. in all capitals. And I go, Dan, you should reply with, you know, um, I'm extraordinarily average looking, not sure if I should apply, should I? (laughs) And and I'm like, she'll never respond to you anyways. And so he did, he wrote, um, I don't think I'm hot. I'm extraordinarily average looking. Can I still apply? James, she replied. Awesome. She replied. I was like, oh my God, this, this is so, you know, I'm like, send all, send her information to all your students. And it was, it was, it was quite funny, but I was just dying laughing because if it was me and I responded, you know, I do yes interested all the time now. I, I'm still waiting for that reply, James. I haven't gotten likewise, one. Likewise, likewise. Well, look, so. I, I guess look, on that on that um, sentiment, look, what, what's next for you? You said kind of earlier on in the show that, you know, you would like to, you know, be COO, CEO of, of um, a company at some point. What, what are your plans? My plans are, you know, I, I want to continue to learn. I like to refer to myself as a sponge. You know, I certainly don't know it all. I'll never know it all, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I want to just, you know, I, I, I got to get some more time in my in my current position. Obviously, you know, I've, I'm coming up on my one-year anniversary as an associate director. And, you know, I'm, I'm just going to keep going, keep pedaling upstream and you know, I have dreams and ambitions of, of you know, becoming a C-level one day, hopefully. I, I definitely want to stay on the sponsor side. I love the startup biotech small flat organization structure that to me just really um, allows me to shine, develop processes, build out teams. But, you know, I, I'm not 100% sure, James. All I know is that, um, you know, I, I want to keep going and, and impact patients' lives and bring those therapies to those who need them. So I know it's cliche, but that's really my motive. And, you know, I do have a benevolent agenda in terms of what I want to do. But for me, it's kind of just getting more experience, you know, more leadership skills, developing myself emotionally, mentally, professionally, and continuing to grow as a person. 
Awesome stuff. Well, it'll be good to see how that pans out. And um, that one thing's for sure is, you know, when you're there, I'll certainly be on your case to do your recruitment. <laughs> Believe me, James, um, you're, you're number one there. I mean, listen, there's nobody better that I'd want to work with than you. I mean, you know, I just, I have a lot of respect for you. You're a straight shooter. And I truly believe you have the candidates that you work with, you know, especially, you know, you and I haven't had a business relationship yet, but I do believe honestly, and I'm not saying this because if, if I thought otherwise, number one, I wouldn't be on your show. And number two, I would probably tell you, but I do believe that you have the best interest out for those that you work with. And you're truly an advocate for what's in their best interest. And yes, you deserve, you know, the financial compensation that comes with it, but you're not there to, to, to toot anybody's horn and give a false sense of hope. And, you know, if you can help somebody, you're going to help somebody. And, and that's why I admire you and your agency. So, um, you know, it, we'll be there together. I say almost like Dan, I say, look, I'm, I'm often quite average at doing it, but I think being <laughs> average and talking straight to people actually gets the best results. Like that's, it's a weird little way. Let's go with extraordinarily it. average, Jim. Fair <laughs> enough. Okay. I'll take <laughs> it. And look, to close the show, Robert, we always finish up with a quick fire question uh, round. So look, to, to hit off with number one, what is the, the one piece of advice that you would give to your younger self? stay humble, stay hungry, be more of a listener than a talker. Cool. I like it. And um, I guess the next question, books, resources, podcasts, what would you, what is the number one resource that you'd perhaps recommend for our audience to, I mean, some are, you know, budding entrepreneurs, other CRAs, other people kind of your level, you know, what, what's the number one book or resource that you'd recommend? So, you know, I got to give a shout out to Dan, you know, he's got the clinical research handbook um, that him and Chris, Chris wrote, I, I really think that's phenomenal, you can get it on Amazon, of course, Dan's, you know, YouTube channel for just clinical research insights, and his CRC Academy is phenomenal, you know, I, I've met and conversed with a lot of his students past and present. Um, you know, th that's a really good resource for people, it's, it's not overwhelming, it's not intimidating. That's just my opinion. It's a self, you know, I don't get any compensation for this, by the way. Um, it's, it's strictly an opinion, but you know, there's a lot of resources out there, whatever works for you, tons of YouTube videos, um, you know, give a shout out to Brad Hightower, his note to file podcast. Um, if you're interested at the site level and, and, and things that go on and, you know, uh, there, mm -hmm. but I, but I think there's, you know, that's a good place to start just to get a high level of curiosity. He addresses a lot of issues and questions that you're thinking that you probably are already asking as well agreed and again for transparency that's where i started like when i got into this i was just like right i need to know as much as i can as fast as i can dan's youtube channel was just incredible yeah um and look, i guess you'll probably be doing it as you know in your your current role but certainly probably more as you progress uh, to that CEO role that you're going to land at some point. Um, but what are the top three, three qualities that you value most um, in your peers and in the teams that you put together? So number one, first and foremost, accountability. Mm -hmm. Accountability, I can't speak more, more of. Um, integrity and humility. Smart. I think, the, I like I think those, are, those are just, you know, paramount features that, you know, I still work on till this day. Um, and if I could add a fourth, James, empathy. <laughs> yeah, you can. You can do what you like. You can do what you like. And look, we'll close the show off with this one. And it's kind of, yeah, I, I guess often get so hooked up talking about, you know, clinical research, how it works, different job roles, et cetera, et cetera. But ultimately, look, we're all human beings. We all like to have a good laugh, you know didn't know that you had a pilot pilot's license for sure um <laughs> but look what what else do you get up to what is your favorite thing outside of work so james i i, I also do magic i've been no. doing ma yeah man i've been doing magic you mind tricks like, well then well you know that's <laughs> that's that's part of it but i actually you know i love i love card tricks and everything i'm super into it it's uh even even well into my uh, you know, forties now, um, I, I still, still, still dabble in it. So mm. that's a little, that's something probably nobody knows about me, but yeah, I, I love it. I've been doing it since I was 13 years old and I still, 
still do uh tricks on my uh on my my, my fiance right now so uh, not you know any crazy tricks but just you know magic tricks coin no tricks card off. tricks exactly no sawing her an app or anything exactly so um yep perfect now again it's just again without having these conversations you just don't find these things out but that's that's kind of what i'm all about as a recruiter and just in in general i'm curious so look, thanks very much for sharing all of that and for being a part of, of the podcast and look for anyone wanting to reach out to you to you know to find out more about yourself with whether it's opportunities um finding out about tech pharma or just general questions what's the best way to get hold of you yeah just reach out to me via linkedin um you know we can put a link in my to my linkedin underneath here the video description we are hiring right now at tech field so um you know i'm looking to build out a team of um you know, potentially some in-house CRAs, some clinical trial managers, some clinical trial assistants, CRO experience is, is a must. So mm -hmm. if you're going to think about reaching out to me, please consider that first. Um, but yeah, reach out to me on LinkedIn. Let's connect. Um, I love, like I say, my network is my net worth. I've, you know, you've said that I've said that on many different occasions on different platforms. Um, I love to connect with people. I I'm going to be doing a mentoring session a little bit later today. Um, and I love helping people. So if there's anything I can do for you, please feel free to reach out. Awesome stuff. Well, uh, thanks again for being on the show, Robert. Been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me, James. Take it easy. Good man.